the floor you Mike. I didn't get it. <laughs> it's my privilege to introduce to us uh, the next period of the hour. And of course, we all these speakers actually have a bio up here, and I'll read portions of it, but I'll state this even before I look down at it. Michael's a good man, and I have tremendous respect for him for the uh, stand that he has taken in light of all of the mess, as I call it, that uh, has started with the, uh, uh, the Gospel Journal. And I um, I cannot say too much, but I appreciate him for that. Well, my born in Pensacola, he's there now preaching. Uh, he is the son of a Gospel preacher. I never met Karen, but uh, so he tells me he's married to Karen Savage. They have two sons. He has done local work in Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas. He is presently working with the Bellevue Church of Christ in Pensacola. He's spoken, of course, on many lectureships, uh, gospel meetings, and youth groups. He's done video and television work. He's also taught at the uh, at Texahoma, uh, say it, Texahoma. That's, that's it's misspelled here. School of Biblical uh, Studies in Denison, Texas, was a uh, director at the State Street Church of Christ in um, Virginia. He's directed uh, lectureships before, including uh, currently the uh, director of the Bellevue lecture, uh, Lectures. Of course, he has written uh, uh, for um, many publications. Uh, he was the associate editor of the Shield of Faith and is now the editor of the Defender, um, the Beacon, uh, the Bellevue Lecture uh, books on the uh, Time was on the board of directors of uh, the Gospel Journal. I guess he would be the ex-secretary. Yeah. But then here in big print, at the bottom, whatever, he's still a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> and we appreciate him for that. I, I certainly, again, personally appreciate him and look forward to hearing Brother Michael bring a lesson to us. Brother Michael, come speak to him. I do appreciate the opportunity to be here again. Appreciate the this congregation, the stand that you take. Appreciate the us here and all that they do, uh, both for this congregation and the brotherhood. Appreciate uh, Brother Brown. Uh, he opens up his home to me every year, and I have the opportunity to stay him and his good and it's certainly appreciated uh, and I appreciate the very kind introduction by brother Jack uh, not sure it's always always deserved but uh, it is nice to hear I have the subject of the economy of the church and fellowship this morning and when Jesus came into this world to seek and save the lost, he built or he established his church. Matthew 16 and verse 18, where he says that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, that rock of course being that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church, and the gate of the east shall not prevail against it. The church was, contrary to popular doctrine today, false doctrine today, it was planned from the very before the beginning of time, prepared throughout all of the Old Testament time period. And then there was the preparation by God and by Jesus, and then by our Lord, and began on that first Pentecost after his resurrection from the grave. There is but one church, as he stated, he would build my church, he says, not plural. In Ephesians 4 and verse 4, we find that there is but one body. And Paul had already identified that body as being in the church in Ephesians 1, 2, and 23. And since there is but one body, and that body is the church, there is only one church. 
But the very fact that it is described as a head and a body shows that it is a ligandism. Within living beings and organisms, there is a structure. There is an organization. And that's true of the Lord's Church as well. There is an organization with that structure of the church. Christ is the head of that church. Ephesians 1, 22 and 3, that God has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Christ is the head of the church. And he, again, in Colossians 1 and verse 18, that he is the head of the body, the church, who is the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Christ is the head. We thus correctly are and preach that any religious organization that has early headquarters cannot be the church that Jesus Christ established. It's an impossibility because Christ is no longer on earth, he's in heaven. And being in heaven and him being the head, therefore the headquarters are in heaven and on earth. As the head, he has the right, of course, to rule, to control the church, his body, even as a physical head has the right to control uh, the physical body. Christ has the right to control, to rule, to give the laws and expect obedience from us of that spiritual body. But within that spiritual body, there are local congregations that make up that universal church. When Jesus stated, I will build my church in Matthew 16 and verse 18, we see the church in the universal sense. It wasn't in a specific location that he's dealing with at that point in time. You do find congregations are churches within a local congregation or within a local area local individual congregations thus make up that church universal. Thus we start reading of the church of God at Corinth, or which is at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2. Because there's the saints at Corinth and they are the church that is there. Or in 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 1, Paul, Silas, and to the church of the Thessalonians. And so there you have the church at Thessalonica. It wasn't a different church than the church universal. It was a part of that church universal. And even a different location than the church at Corinth, still the same church. It wasn't print as far as organization, structure, work, uh, worship, work, and all of those other aspects that are important and that make up the, the church. When uh, Christ, through John, was winning to the churches in Asia, there were, he mentions the seven churches of Asia, Revelation 1 and verse 4. And so you have local congregations picking up that one church that Jesus Christ built and established, that universal church. Within that local creation then, there is certain organization within that local creation. We see it very well defined in Philippians first chapter and verse one. That Paul in writing to this congregation, this church at Philippi, he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with bishops and deacons. And so you have all of the saints, that the individual members of that local congregation at Philippi, the local church at Philippi. And within that local church at Philippi, there were bishops and deacons. Let me mention deacons 
first because I want to spend a little bit more time with uh, this aspect, but uh, the deacons are those individuals we find in 1 Timothy, the third chapter, that would be servants of of God, special servants in which they work those areas in which the bishops decide. But now then, let's get that aspect of this. Bishops are those who are the preachers of that local creation. Well, so the denominational world, or many in the denominational world would think of. They're not, unless they are appointed to that office and meeting those qualifications of 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. They are also called elders, pastors. Those terms only identify the office in which they... It deals with the work in which they do. That deals with their bishops. It deals with the aspect of overseeing, of ruling within that local congregation. Elders, that term is reference to their age, maturity, the wisdom which they are to possess as they rule that congregation. And then pastors or shepherds in the way in which they do that ruling and that controlling aspect. Thus, with that congregation at Philippi, the church at Philippi, you have saints, you have bishops who are overseeing the work, you have deacons who are servants in those matters that the servants had decided for them to work in. But this lesson also deals with autonomy. The word autonomy comes two parts, auto and then nomos. Self is auto and nomos means law. And thus literally self-law. It's dealing with the government of the congregation. Now then, of course, when we've already established the fact that Jesus is the head of the church, they cannot and do not have the right to overrule the laws that God has made. He's the controlling one. But within that area of work that God has given, the laws that Christ has set forth, certainly going to be ways in which there's going to be variations in which to carry out those laws. For example, this uh, congregation for worship at 10.30 on Sunday morning, so it's a nod with it. <laughs> other congregations meet at other times. And out here, like me, who gets up early, might rather it be at 6 o'clock in the morning, or even earlier. <clears throat> Someone else who likes to sleep late, they might sleep later on. Who's going to make the decision as to when we come together? Together to worship. That's within the realm of that congregation and the elders of the overseers of that congregation. And so we start seeing an aspect of autonomy that they make decisions for their congregation in those matters of carrying out or expediting God's laws. That's why, as Paul, in his second mission, or his first missionary journey, in the 14th chapter, after he went through and established churches, they came back through, and it says, when they ordained them elders in every church, Acts 14 and verse 23. Why? Because the, he knew that he needed to be that organization within that local congregation. But he did it within every congregation, every church. There are ordained elders. Why? Because that local congregation is going to be autonomous. It's going to be self-ruling. As Paul's talking to the Ephesian elders, as recorded in Acts the 20th chapter. Verse 28 tells us, or he tells them, take heed therefore unto yourselves and the flock, 
and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Why, you feed this congregation. You oversee this congregation of God's people. Specifically, these elders from Ephesus oversee that congregation at Ephesus. You make sure that they do those things that God wants them to do. You make rules and you govern that congregation in the expediting of God's laws. But what about another congregation over there? Well, their own elders, they're going to bring it in relation to that congregation. We'll come back to this in a little bit more, but they thus do not have that right to rule over another congregation. They have the right to rule over their congregation, their church. Thus, self-ruling, a self-law, or in that regards to expediting God's commands. First Peter, the fifth chapter, Peter, an elder himself, says that he's going to exhort them, verses 1 and verse 2. He gives his qualifications for exhorting them. I'm also an elder. I'm a witness of the sufferings of Christ. I am a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So here's his qualifications of exhorting these elders. Then he says, verse 2, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for free lucre, but of a ready mind. Notice the phrase, though, among you. Feed the flock of God which is among you. In fourth, congregational autonomy there. That it's not feed the church of God which is someplace else. Oversee the church of God which is yourselves. You oversee the congregation of which you are part and which you oversee. There is a flock that is there. You take care of that flock. So understand a little bit of sound reasoning in this. Because if we have congregation autonomy as set forth in the scriptures, then if a congregation over here, congregation X over here, departs from the faith, they begin apostatizing from the truth. Their apostasy is not going to affect other congregations when they are set up and designed in the way in which God has set forth. Why? Because these other congregations are ruling themselves and not being controlled by this congregation. But also from a practicality standpoint, we see the, the need for congregational autonomy. And just an illustration. I at Pensacola, Florida, the Bellevue Congregation. We have two elders there, good men. And I appreciate it. But there they are in Pensacola, Florida. How would they know how to expedite the things that were in the spring congregation? How would they know to do that? How would they know what decisions are best in regards to the spring congregation? They're hundreds of miles away. The elders are overseeing the work of the church. They are expediting the work that God has given us. How is is an eldership hundreds of miles away going to make the best decisions for another congregation? Thus, from a practicality standpoint, we see the need for autonomy. But also, in looking at the question of autonomy in church fellowship, we need to realize, first off, that our fellowship is going to be extended within the congregation. 
when one obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ, he comes into a fellowship with all of the faithful all over the world. I may not know someone, but if he is in fellowship with God and I am in fellowship with God, then I am in fellowship with him. But there's also the congregation. He identifies himself with a congregation. Within that congregation, there is going to be chip within that congregation. Tonight, the chapter. Saul came to Jerusalem. He had been in Damascus. And he says, A saved find himself to the disciples. We might call that. He tried to place membership with the church at Jerusalem. And it says that they were afraid of him and believed not the disciple. They refused him fellowship. We're not going to accept you all into the fellowship of this congregation. Uh, we've had some discussions about this this week, and I've always felt that it would be rather stupid to accept someone into your fellowship of a congregation and then immediately have to turn around and withdraw fellowship from you. <laughs> And the way in which it needs to be done, certain individual would request to place membership within that congregation, and the elders, the entire individual, and decide whether or not that that individual can be a member of that congregation and be in fellowship with them. Be a Christian. Can't assume things anymore, brethren. The individual might have come from another congregation. Uh, Saul here. They didn't believe he was a disciple. You mean you have a right to question someone's whether he is a disciple of Christ or not? Absolutely. And we need to. Because a lot of people come from congregations that are not sound and not teaching the truth anymore that accepted in their fellowship those who have never been scripturally baptized. And if we simply accept those individuals into our fellowship because they have moved here, we're accepting into fellowship someone who's not a Christian. He might be involved in some sin. And in fact, that may be he's leaving one congregation and coming to another one because he's involved in some sin and they're not going to put up with it. So he sees the writing all, which of course is never there. <laughs> and he leaves and comes to another congregation. But within that congregation, there is a ship. Saul, when he came to Jerusalem, was wanting to join himself to the disciples. Why? Because there was a fellowship there. That fellowship is seen in the spiritual realm. You see that, for example, in the second chapter and verse 42. Here's the church at Jerusalem. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayer. There's a Fellowship from a spiritual aspect in relationship to a congregation. When we sing together, when we pray together, when we study God's Word together, when we partake of the Supper and give means, we're having fellowship one with another on a spiritual level. There's also a social aspect to that fellowship. I believe you see that, that even though abused by some, it's a love feast of Jude, verse 12. That these are spots in your feast of charity, your love feast. And the fact that fellowship can be withdrawn, that end of it, if he persists in sin. 1 Corinthians 5, chapter, verse 4 and 5. 
in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you're gathered together, what does that mean? That means when you come together as a church, then a congregation. What do you do? He's with my spirit and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved the day of the Lord Jesus. You, as a congregation, withdraw your fellowship from that impenitent sinner in order to withdraw ship though there needs to be fellowship first I believe that many times those who do practice withdrawing the fellowship the problem comes that they really never had fellowship to begin with and so it doesn't work as some people call it even though it does but many of the times the problem is there's a fellowship there there is to be and then when that fellowship is withdrawn then it causes him to feel aimed and it does cause a pricking of their conscience to try to restore them to that the faith So there is fellowship within that congregation, and that fellowship be withdrawn. There is also congregational fellowship with another congregation. Brother Broking uh, established this very well, but let me mention uh, Acts 11th chapter. The church at Jerusalem sent Barnabas to exhort the church at Antioch verses 22 through verse 24. Later in that chapter, verses 27 through verse 30, Antioch expressed a fellowship for the church at Jerusalem by sending financial support to them because of a famine that was going to be there. There's two congregations shipping each other. Paul experienced that fellowship with Corinth and with Philippi. Various patients we find in St. Corinthians 11 and verse 8 were sending support. He was robbing other churches, he said, taking wages of them. But we find in Philippians 4th chapter and verse 14 through 16 that only Philippi was having that type of giving and receiving them. Banking terms of in funds from other congregations, that means those other congregations were in fellowship the church at Philippi. And Philippi was sending that money to uh, Paul. The church at Philippi was having fellowship with, with Paul. But so were these other congregations that were sending money to Philippi that were being forwarded on to Paul. But there here is one congregation sending money to another congregation in support of a gospel preacher. That is, one congregation fellowship another congregation. And thus there is that inter-congregational fellowship at that standpoint. And also say the church at Philippi was also fellowshipping the Corinthian church by sending that money to Paul for his preaching while he was at Corinth. Likewise, that fellowship can be withdrawn. Now that's my other lesson, so I'm not going to talk about that now, but uh, that fellowship can be withdrawn as well. Now that being said in that basis, let me mention some applications and some problems that we see. Many times when you have a congregation that starts doing something that's questionable and others question them, they fall back to, well, we are autonomous. You don't have a right to question us. You need to get over there and you need to mind your own business and we'll mind our business. Stop meddling in other brethren's business. I'm sure you've never heard of any of those terms and phrases. Why are y'all laughing? 
I, surely no one would say that. Well, yes, they do. Is it the case that autonomous congregations cannot be concerned with other congregations? The very fact that congregations can extend fellowship to another congregation shows that there's not an exclusion that's there. It's not, not congregational exclusion. It's congregational autonomy. In other words, simply because I, I am a congregation here does not mean others are excluded totally. There is an interaction that is to be there, even patients, as we see the situation with Paul and those other congregations that extended fellowship one to another. But also, aren't we members of Universal? If we're members of the Church Universal and they are members of the Church Universal, and thus, by the fact that, the, that we are both members of that Church Universal should pass on for another as brethren in Christ. And thus, if we sing someone who is starting to depart from the faith, should we not be concerned with that individual to go to them and try to correct their mistakes, to bring them out of the air, to save another congregation from ruin and destruction, and in that saving of that congregation? Maybe save many souls. If not, why not? How can we ignore part of the body of Christ simply because they cry out congregational autonomy? But then let me mention some aspects of congregational overseeing works. I first mentioned in that overseeing figureheads. And if you don't know what I mean by that, it is that here's a congregation that is just a figurehead and not really overseeing anything. You get this and you design it and, okay, I need someone to oversee this. But I really don't want anyone to oversee it. So let me find someone, just let me do whatever I want to. And now then I can write brotherhood. Hey, such and such congregation is my overseeing congregation. And I draw in all this money now when that congregation has absolutely no oversight of the work. How can that congregation and those elders, the overseeing congregation and elders of that congregation, engage in such foolishness. And yet, doesn't it happen all of the time? Aren't we seeing it more and more? And we have some preachers who want the ocean field, but they don't want any control by that congregation that's at home. You let let me get out here and let me do my own thing. You just take in the funds and send the funds to me however I want them and for whatever reason I want them. And this congregation now becomes a figure of oversight when there is no oversight that's involved. Right? And that's wrong. And we need to be concerned about such actions by preachers. Why do they, number one, want to get out on their own without any oversight? And why would a congregation allow it? Some start overseeing the work design a work, then ask money from other people, and that does not violate congregational autonomy, as we've already mentioned very briefly. But 
because of that fellow that congregations can have one with another. And so they have every right to go out to the brotherhood to ask for money. But then how many times do you see them doing that? And then, but you don't question what we do. We're in control of this. You have no right, no part in it. You don't have any say in it. You don't question us. Why not? Why does a congregation that is sending money to them and an eldership who is overseeing the money as being sent to them not have a right to question the work in which is being done? And why should they not be questioning it? How dare an eldership or seeing a congregation and the funds of that congregation send money to some place and not see that it's being used properly? Those elders then, if they fail to make sure that it's being used properly, are not doing their work of oversight. They have an obligation to the brethren, themselves, and to God to make sure that that congregation that takes that money is doing with it what needs to be done and is remaining true to God with it. But some congregations say, oh, no, we're questioning. Don't you question us. And some get so big that they think they are above such. But they're not. We need to be careful in relationship to maintaining congregational autonomy. And one other section because that we see many times, and there is a congregation starting a work and trying to dictate to others what to do. And we're seeing that within the Lord's Church as well. That is a violation of congregational autonomy. They have no right to control and to decide for an congregation and the members of that congregation what they're going to do. And yet some are doing that thing. Autonomy, yes, it's necessary, it's important. We need congregational auto <coughs> autonomy, but that does not mean exclusivism. One congregation is not cut off from every other congregation in the brotherhood simply because they are autonomous. Let's work together as faith congregations, though, and encourage faithful congregations, and yes, support financially through prayers and through every other way that is right and honorable other congregations that are faithful. And also, let's help each other go to heaven. That's what really it's all about. Thank you. Appreciate that good and timely lesson, Brother Michael. So, uh, a couple of things that have come up, of course, during the lecture so far, we talked about church discipline. I know that that makes a lot of people uncomfortable, the doctrine of discipline, if you will. But that's God's plan of restoration. That's what it is. Discipline's involved, but it is God's plan for restoration. But the autonomy of church, of course, is a, an important topic. Certainly, as Michael pointed out, Jesus is the head of the church, and there is no earthly headquarters. And our, our father, just when he uh, chose his son, in whom is no guile and, and no sin, and made him the head of the church. And therefore, we never have to worry about a corruption that might begin at the head of the church. As one author noted, of course, to be fair to him, the context really here was speaking of denominations, but I think there's a principle here that applies to what we were talking about this week. It's noted when there is a strong synthesized tie that binds organically all congregations, 
or many congregations. And I want you to think about figureheads and their organizations and that alphabet soup of like MFOP, AP, GBN, OABS, ETC, if I throw them in. When there's a strong centralized tie that binds organically congregations, it is well nigh impossible to keep contamination from spreading like wildfire when it begins to its course. And how fast has it spread over the last 18, 20 months? By the way, the author of that statement was Robert Taylor and the elder in his work. We are going to break for lunch. Uh, might want to give a few minutes for the ladies to get things ready. Certainly want to uh, run everybody, uh, Brother Gunn's uh, forms up here for all the CDs and, and other things that he is going to be, be providing in the lectureship. Um, also, uh, want to mention that uh, those that will be participating in Truth Bible Institute, if you would grab your lunch up and meet upstairs, I need to go through, through some things with you. So uh, to eat and watch me demo. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll just apologize right up front. Anyway, if you could do that, I would certainly would appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to uh, call on. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Oh yes, the. Uh, okay. The open forum uh, this uh, afternoon at 3:30. Um, of course, uh, that again, I want to remind you those, especially those that are joining us over the internet, that you can. Send your questions at seoc at swbell.net, seoc at swbell.net. If you would, uh, those on the Internet and also those here, would you, if you would, keep those questions, uh, the, uh, make them related to the that's under discussion this week, that of fellowship, uh, we certainly would appreciate it. I'm going to uh, Brother Bruce Dalton, if you will, to come and lead us in a prayer. Remember the uh, lunch about take up.